I'm Dr. Ashley Taylor from SRH Veterinary Services. Uh, tonight I talked about winterizing your horse and we talked about different topics for the winter, which included vaccination protocols for this time of year, um, deworming, blanketing, feeding, water, and um, housing um, for the elements. So we had a pretty good turnout and I think everyone learned a lot. And um, we're excited to have um, you all here on our series. We're going to do one, we're doing one now and we're doing one in January. Um, and I'm introducing Dr. Ashley Taylor, who I, most people have probably met. She's been with us since July. She is a native of Topsfield. She did Pony Club. She went to the University of Finley and then went to veterinary school at Michigan State. And so without further ado, Thank you. Oh my gosh, applause already. I haven't even done anything yet, so that's good. Um, thanks everyone from coming from your warm houses on a cold night to listen to this. So hopefully everyone will learn lots. Um, and the topic, as you know, is just preparing your horse for the winter. That's one of my old horses there. He's made it 33 years in the winter, so doing something right. All right, so just topics for discussion for the evening. Um, we're going to be talking about vaccinations, teeth floating, deworming, feeding, um, blanketing, shelter and housing for the winter, shoeing, exercise, and colic and some other winter ailments. So we're going over a lot. Some of the information is kind of broad, maybe things that you already know, but we can definitely dive deeper into questions and discussion if things come up. And you're, I'm happy if you interrupt me during to ask questions or there'll be time after. So. Either way is fine with me. Vaccinations. So the first vaccination that we often recommend this time of year is influenza, or flu, um, as many people call it. And it's caused by a virus. It's one of the most common respiratory diseases of horses, which is one of the reasons why we vaccinate for it. Um, it young horses and horses that are traveling are more at a risk. And also horses that are in a barn where they have other um, horses that live with them traveling um, to other places. It's highly contagious and it's spread through aerosolized droplets, which can be nose to nose contact and coughing. Um, a lot of clinical signs um, include fever, lethargy, nasal discharge, coughing, weakness, stiffness, and loss of appetite. So, and then I have the bottom just to talk to one of our veterinarians about recommendations for your personalized horse, as I was saying, it depends on what your horse, um, where they're living and their situation for the winter, um, whether they get vaccinated or not for it. The next one is rhinopneumonitis, which is commonly um, combined with flu, for that rhino flu as we kind of shorten it. Um, and it's actually caused by an equine herpes virus. The herpes virus has three different forms. Um, the most common is the respiratory form, which is what we vaccinate for. The scary form is the neurologic form, which are the ones that you guys hear about um, on the news when they have outbreaks and such. Um, but luckily that's not very common. And the third is just um, an abortive form, which we vaccinate pregnant mares for. Um, this is also spread by aerosolized droplets from coughing, um, which can, from direct and indirect contact and through nasal secretions, so um, pretty contagious. And then similar clinical signs include fever, lethargy, anorexia, nasal discharge, and coughing. And once again, if you're um, wondering if your horse fits into the category of getting vaccinated, just talk to us about our recommendations. Another one um, that is kind of new, um, is the Lyme vaccine. I know we've sent some stuff out um, about it and um, there's been a lot of talk and discussion. Um, so this is just a brief little thing and I could do a whole hour presentation on the vaccine and Lyme, as you all know. Um, so right now it's used off-label for horses. Um, it's labeled for use in dogs. However, we found little negative um, side effects and from what we can tell so far, good benefit. Um, as if, if you're interested in getting a horse vaccinated for Lyme, the first step that we recommend is doing a Lyme multiplex. And we submit that to Cornell University. And basically it gives us um, the titers on your horse. And there's three different ones that we look at that tells us whether the horse has been 
uh, has a chronic type infection, an acute exposure, or um, a vaccine-based um, titer. So at that point, we look in if the horse is positive, then we recommend treatment. And if they're negative, then we can go ahead and vaccinate them. Um, the vaccines, we do three boosters, and we do them at days 0, 21, and 90. So it's a little bit different than the typical boosters that we see in some of the other vaccines where we're doing them every three weeks or so. Um, and then with the Lyme vaccine also, um, we're recommending that it gets boosted every six months because the um, protectivity doesn't last more than that, we're finding that it will start to wane and then at the six month mark, you don't have good protection. Teeth floating, um, once again, as many of you know, their horse's teeth grow continuously and they, gra they um, get ground down by contact with the opposite tooth. And so basically what happens is normally horses' teeth are a little bit offset. And so when they're grinding, you get sharp edges along the sides that don't have contact with the opposite tooth. And that's, um, in normal horses, what usually what we're, when we go and we float their teeth, you're taking down those sharp edges um, so that they can grind their food better and they're not injuring the inside of their mouth. Um, horses with normal teeth and normal occlusion as you know, should be floated every six months, six months to a year. And a lot of times we'll check them when we're out in the spring and fall and see if they need to be done at that time. And horses that have pathology or that have problems with their teeth often need to be done more often because they're not having normal grinding in their mouths to help wear the teeth down. So this is important for the winter because if you don't have proper occlusion, a lot of times horses have trouble eating and digesting their food, which can lead to weight loss, which of course we all know is more dangerous in the winter months. Deworming, another um, important management thing. Um, the winter weather is gonna increase the metabolic demand on your horse. And so horses that may have some form of parasitism um, under conditions of stress where their metabolism is increased, it can be, the parasitism can be magnified. Um, fecal egg counts should be performed prior to deworming to address worm burden and resistance, which we've learned um, instead of doing the previous every six to eight weeks um, deworming with different dewormers, we've had problems that have come up with um, resistance in our parasites. And so now um, we're being better about actually looking to see for the individual horse what the worm burden is and then deworming according to that. Um, so that's a, what our practice now is. So just some tips to remember about tube deworming, which seems really easy, but this is even something I'm guilty of with my own horses just spinning it out on the floor after I give it to them. <laughs> um, it's just, just make sure that the horse's mouth is free of feed. A lot of times, like the horses are in while they're getting fed, and so you start going down the barn. And if they have a big wad of um, hay or feed in there, it just sticks to that, and then they just, as soon as you turn around, tend to spit it out. Um, put the entire length of the pasty warmer in the corner where the bit sits and then point it towards the back of the mouth and then get the paste as far back as possible. Once again, makes it a little bit easier um, for them to swallow and less likely to spit out. And then kind of stay with them and monitor for swallowing. I usually hold their heads up um, and, then sometimes, and then just wait for them to chew and swallow. So for this time of year, um, where we do recommend obviously fecal egg counts first um, and if the horse um, is negative, we usually recommend deworming regardless this time of year once we get a good hard frost, which I've been telling people Thanksgiving, but with the weather now, maybe it's going to be sooner, I don't know. Um, and so the big thing that we're looking for um, is praziquantel this time of year, which is going to kill tapeworms. And so tapeworms we don't always see on fecal egg counts because they shed their eggs intermittently. So you may have a fecal sample where you don't have any of the tapeworm eggs in it. So it looks like the horses don't have um, anything and they actually have tapeworms. So um, we recommend doing it after you have a hard frost because you have a decreased um, chance of re-exposure because with the weather conditions so harsh, usually the eggs um, don't survive. So um, 
you, in that the prides of quantile comes with an ivermectin. It's usually mixed with ivermectin or moxidectin, um, which will also kill your other um, nematodes. So um, the products that contain this is the Mectrin Gold, Quest Plus, and Equimax are the three big ones. Um, feeding. So feeding is not complicated enough. It gets a little bit more complicated sometimes in the winter. Um, as horses incre increase their metabolic demand, as I was mentioning earlier, um, in order to maintain a normal body temperature. Um, so for horses, their normal thermal neutral zone, which is basically their ambient te temperature, which they can um, stand in and not have to spend any calories to regulate body temperature, is going to be 41 um, degrees Fahrenheit to 77 Fahrenheit. So um, once it gets below 41, they have to s expend a little extra energy. And then the metabolic rate changes are also going to depend on other management strategies. So whether the horses are kept in stalls at night, if it's a little bit warmer, if they're being blanketed, what kind of shelter they have, et cetera. So um, this got cut off, but it's most important to evaluate the body condition of your horse and feed according to that. Don't feed according to the temperature necessarily. Feed according to the horse. So this is something we could all use practice at, including myself, um, because no one likes to see ribs, and sometimes we tend to overfeed our horses. And so these are the areas when uh, we come out and do like a wellness exam or we assess your horse for a body condition. This is what we're looking for in these areas. So along the neck, the withers, the loin, tail head, ribs, and behind the shoulders. And then this is just the body condition scale. It's from one to nine, which one being poor and emaciated and nine being extremely fat. Um, and we really want horses, you know, from the four to six range, but obviously five is, is good. So um, what we look for along the neck is basically fat deposits. You have all seen crusty necks before. Um, hopefully not in your own horses, um, but that's one area. Um, behind the withers, once again, they can get fat deposits there um, and the tail head. And then they kind of sometimes you notice they're getting fat deposits in their loin and tail head. You get that like almost the river, or I've called it like the butt crack before, not really <laughs> appropriate, but everyone knows what that is. And so that's not ideal. Um, horses that are in that um, area, we obviously recommend um, trying to cut them down so they can lose some weight because obviously um, there's many problems with having an overweight horse, but the big thing that we worry about is laminitis. So um, just remember to continuously assess your horse throughout the winter. It's hard when you're the ones looking at them every day to necessarily notice weight gain or weight loss until it's kind of more severe one way or the other. So feeding um, hay is going to be the major um, source of your horse's caloric intake. And horses, normal horses, should consume 1.5 to 2% of their body weight in hay, which is 15 to 20 pounds for a 1,000-pound horse daily. And just remember that flakes vary largely in weight. They can be anywhere from 1 to 3 pounds. Um, so make sure that you're being cognizant of uh, per bale of hay what, how much each flake is kind of weighing. Um, some people do weigh their hay, which is the most accurate way to actually tell what you're feeding your horse. Um, but otherwise, just be sure that you guys are, are paying attention to that. And I know it's hard because a lot of times, especially in boarding situations, you just have the feed list and, you know, Sunny gets three flakes in the morning, one flake at noon, and three flakes at night. And so one week with a certain amount of hay, maybe they're getting the right amount. And the next week, maybe you get some later bales or, so, you know, something that was baled differently. And they're getting less or more than they should. So just something to pay attention to. Um, round bales versus square bales. A lot of people feed round bales, um, especially in the winter when we don't have much for pasture. And round bale hay quality can be just as good as square bales. Um, however, there does tend to be a little more variability in your, in your round bales. 
and it's more um, common to find poor quality round bales um, because a lot of times if the hay isn't dried properly or that it's not as good as they'd like to bale it, then they just say, we'll round bale it. Um, so just be careful of that. Um, the nutritional quality can also vary significantly between the core, which is the center, and the crust, which is the outside of the round bale. Um, so take this into account when you're feeding. And once again, just another important um, reason to consistently check your horse's body condition and see how they're doing throughout the winter. Um, another kind of con, if you're feeding multiple horses, um, sometimes it's hard to know how much each is eating. And for um, a normal adult horse, that may be okay, but with older horses and horses that may be lower on the totem pole um, can be a little dangerous um, because they can end up losing weight. Um, can be a problem with horses with heaves, um, just because a lot of times they have to kind of stick their heads in there and they're in the hay and getting exposed to some of the allergens and mold and such that will trigger um, heaves. Um, botulism is also a problem um, for horses eating um, round bales. And we recommend vaccinating for botulism if your horse is going to be fed from a round bale. Um, and then horses that have not been vaccinated need to be boosted every three to four weeks for three doses. And then they're not fully protected until eight weeks. So um, depending on what time of the year you're getting the round bales, if you're closer to winter, just try to be cognizant of thinking that you want to try to start um, boostering them or start the vaccine series eight weeks out if they're, they haven't been vaccinated before. So um, another common error is sometimes putting out more hay than that can be consumed in three to seven days. This is more for horses that are living out and people who are feeding mass amounts of hay at a time. Um, you know, depending on the weather, especially New England, it can vary greatly on whether we're having sun or rain or snow or sleet. Um, if the hay is getting wet, then it's going to go bad faster and the horses are going to be less, less likely to eat it. Um, Another thing is that we always talk about nutrition. We look at um, bags of feed and concentrates, and they all have um, they all have the nutritional data right on them. And we spend a lot of time analyzing them and thinking how we're going to feed our horses according to that. When in fact, as I was saying earlier, hay is where they should are, should be getting the majority of their caloric intake, and we really don't know what the hay's nutritional value is because it doesn't come with a little tag that tells us. So um, it's important to periodically test hay. And I know that can be difficult because I think the big thing is storage. If you don't have a lot of storage, then you're getting a lot of turnover of different hay. Um, but if you do have storage and you're getting a large amount, especially for the winter, not a bad idea to have um, a bale tested. And there are places that um, We'll do it for you, and it's pretty inexpensive. I think it was like $30 or something last time I checked. Um, but Equa Analytical Labs does it, and I think Blue Seal um, also, and they'll send you basically like a little um, sample container that you can send, you mail it out to them, and then they send you um, a nutritional fact sheet back with everything that the hay has, and then it helps you kind of gauge how to feed your horse properly taking into account what nutritional value the hay has and the specific grain that you're feeding them as well. And you know, we're happy to help with that also. If you do get your hay tested, then we can kind of look at it and see um, how to feed appropriately with the grain that you have. And then also just a little reminder, a good quality hay can mitigate the risk of colic. So. Okay, so grain, this is tend to what, what everyone kind of focuses more on. We need to just remember, um, you're going to feed depending on um, age, body condition, workload, temperature, and ability to consume roughage in the form of hay. As you know, a lot of the older horses um, can't eat hay, so we end up kind of doing some other um, things to make sure that they get What do you mean fiber. by temperature? So temperature, like the cold, like if it's really cold, then you're oh, going to... The outside, okay. Exactly, the outside temperature. Yeah, not the temperature of the horse. So. Um, when it's getting really cold, um, their metabolic rate's increasing, and so like feeding more hay, things like that. Um, yeah? Uh, what about, like I have that, 
my old stud and I he can't eat hay anymore. Yeah. How much like hay stretcher or whatever do I feed? You know what I mean? Yeah. So the um, hay stretcher usually I have to check, but it's usually per pound. A hay stretcher is like a pound of um, actually I think it's less than that. I'll, I'll have to check for the hay stretcher conversion to hay because um, I think it's it's different than the um, actual poundage. So I'll check on that for you. Yeah. The one thing we found. Um, I don't know if you recommend supplements, but our Appy uh, was at a new barn a couple of years ago, and because of the activity in the winter, my daughter didn't notice it, and he really lost at least 75 to 100 pounds. Yeah. And even though he was getting the regular grain and unlimited hay, mm -hmm. and we ended up um, starting him on a um, omega-10, mm -hmm. which we found very little. It's 20% fat, and it's got almost no carbs and very little, literally um, a, um, a half, I think a half to three quarters of a quart a day kept him from losing any weight. That's good. It was, it was impressive to the point that it's become a winter routine. Right, right, and some horses will need a little extra help over the winter, and so like fat supplements like that are helpful um, because you're giving them a really easy source of energy with the fat, so that's good. And if you're, you know, some horses, if you're noticing, if you have a horse that's a little bit of a harder keeper over the winter, then that's definitely something to consider, just a high we fat supplement. To lower the senior grain, so we didn't feel like he was getting too much. Right, food. right. Yeah, because you can't, you can increase feed to a certain amount, especially yeah. concentrates, but you really don't want to start giving them, you know, really more than three quarts for like a regular size horse per feeding, because then you run into other digestive problems. So, yeah feeding a higher protein, higher fat grain in a less amount is better than feeding more. It works yeah. really well and it's not really expensive. Good. Very good. Can I ask yeah. what was that? Was Omega-10? Omega-10, um, Blue Seal um, puts it out and it was, it's been phenomenal. I mean, usually he gets like um, two quarts of senior and a quart of hay pellets of feeding. He's about 900 pounds, happy, very active, gets ridden almost every day. And we went down a quart, or a half, I think a quart in the senior, mm -hmm. and used a half a quart twice a day in the Omega-10. And last winter we had no weight loss. Mm -hmm. And he looks fantastic, and he looked fantastic. He came mm -hmm. through the winter in flying colors. It's about, it's $28 for like a 25 pound bag, 30 pound bag. That's good, yep. That's a good point. That's definitely the fat supplements do, and that's something, yeah, definitely recommend. Okay, so water. This is a little bit of a, a misconception and kind of um, interesting that water intake um, has to, we keep talking about metabolic rate, and the harder the cells work, the more water they need. So water intake actually increases in the winter. Um, I know a lot of people um, relate water intake to how hot it is out, but um, it actually is higher in the winter. So your horse can drink between 20, or sorry, 10 to 30 gallons of water per day in the winter, and then it can sometimes they can drink twice as much as they do during the summer months. And if they don't, they should be. They should be drinking more. Um, horses prefer water temperature to be between 45 and 65 degrees, um, and even a thin layer of ice on top of the water trough or a bucket can deter them from drinking. Um, so if you do see a small layer of ice on the water buckets, make sure you're cleaning that out. Um, sometimes they're silly and they don't realize, like you think, oh, they can push their nose through and get water, but they don't always do that. <laughs> if you're using an electrical water heater, uh, make sure it's properly grounded. This is something I actually just learned um, last year where we had a case with a horse that um, had impaction colic and they found that the horse was not drinking enough um, throughout the winter and they couldn't figure out why because they had um, all the, the um, main water source was heated and was never frozen, they hadn't had any issues. And so one thing is that you can get free voltage 
from some of the heaters. And that was, in fact, the case in this um, horse. And so it's something that you can't necessarily feel with your hand when you stick your hand in. It's not really sensitive enough, but there are muzzles and the um, can sense that. And so it may drive them, maybe enough that it drives them away from drinking. Um, always make sure you have a salt or mineral block available to your horse. Um, you can also try flavoring water um, with a sugar-free Kool-Aid, Gatorade, alfalfa cubes, something that's going to make it a little bit more interesting to drink. Um, but just make sure if you are going to doctor the water up at all that you always have some fresh plain water available um, for them to, in case they prefer that instead. Um, you may need to experiment with water temperature a little bit to see what your horse likes best. And then another easy way to sometimes add some um, water to your horse's diet is just either feeding mashes or adding some warm water to their grain. And that kind of forces the water consumption. I know some horses will not eat their grain wet. Um, but if you have a horse that does, um, not a bad idea to add some warm water to it. Blanketing, so this is a big um, topic. I know a lot of people have questions on blanketing that I talk to. Um, and there's a lot of considerations that we have to kind of think about before you jump into it. Um, I always look at the age of the horse, the breed of the horse, um, body condition, if they have a hard time maintaining weight. Um, and do you have the time and ability, or whoever's taking your care of your horse have the time and ability to change blankets accordingly, and then also um, medical considerations. So, um, you know, when we don't blanket appropriately, you can have um, sweating, which can lead to dehydration, which is our enemy in the winter, and then also other problems like rain rot and fungus. So healthy horses have the opportunity to gradually acclimate to the colder weather in this um, part of the country and we'll usually have warm winter coats by November. So with the hair coat that they get um, by November, they can tolerate temperatures into the single digits before adding a wind chill. And this is the big thing to remember is as long as their coats stay dry. If they get wet, they greatly lose their ability to thermoregulate. So um, keep that in mind. So um, there's many options that I'm sure many of you um, do here. Some people will start blanketing as, soon, as early as late August or early September is when we start getting some colder evenings to try to decrease um, coat growth. Some will let the coats grow body clip um, later in the fall and start blanketing then. And then some just let the winter coat grow in and then blanket in extreme um, weather and temperatures. So one thing, if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about blanketing your horse and have it before, um, make sure you measure them and get an accurate size. Um, and horses can get sores and rubs from ill-fitting blankets. Um, there is a handout on the back of the room. Um, it was Equus Magazine. Um, put out a pretty good article on blanketing. And um, it's pretty inclusive, more than what I had time to go through in the um, presentation. But it goes over measuring your horse for a blanket. And I know a lot of the companies, the one who did that article was Horseware Island. So they talk a lot about their different um, blankets that they offer. But a lot of the other companies, if you go online, they have sizing charts and way to measure. So make sure that um, you know, you're measuring your horse and getting an appropriate size so you don't run into issues. Um, another thing to think about is how tough your horse is on his clothes. Um, the two things that we look at is um, the denier and the polyfill. Um, the denier is the outside shell of the blanket. If you have um, a horse that's turned out by himself, 600 is probably suitable. And then if you have a horse that's kind of in a pasture with rough buddies or tough on his clothes, um, the 1200 denier thread co count, I think, kind of some of the highest that they get. Um, they have like ballistic nylon, like they have all these claims um, about how tough it is. Um, unclipped horses are usually fine through the winter with a medium weight blanket, which medium weight is 180 to 220 grams of polyfill. And clipped horses are gonna need a heavy weight, especially around um, here with 300 to 400 grams of polyfill. And that handout also um, has the different weights of the blankets and the amount of polyfill that you need. When you said clipped, 
Mm -hmm. You mean the whole horse's clipped or just the, because yeah. I just do Uma's chest and her butt. Yeah, so that she's going to have less of an issue with getting cold, so that's a little bit different. When I'm talking clipped, I'm talking about body clipped. Oh, like, okay. so, um, but still, it's, you're kind of like in the in-between, because it's not body clipped, but she is going to have some. So you do her, what, her chest and her... Yeah, sort of a little bit of her butt, because she sweats like crazy when, when she works. Right, right, so just to clean her up. So yeah. So she probably won't need as heavy as a blanket when it's no cold, blankets. but then, yeah, and if she does fine with that, then that's okay. Yep. The, the clipped horses I'm talking about on this are the ones that get their whole body done. Okay, so shelter and housing. Um, a good run and shed should be placed so that the open sides are facing away from the elements. Um, and so in the northeast, it should be facing south and slightly east. Um, it's also important to understand her dynamics and the size of the shed and amount of horses. So um, you may have one boss horse who decides he wants to shed all to himself and then everyone else has to stand out in the snow or the rain. Or you might have a tiny shed and 10 horses and they're not all going to get in there. So um, just be cognizant of that. Um, so also for the winter when, especially if a horse if you have a horse that's used to going out um, and grazing, um, consider providing them some sort of entertainment. Um, I said toys are free access to hay, which once again isn't appropriate for all horses. Um, so they have these nibble nets now, which I think a lot of you have um, utilized, which basically they're hay nets with smaller holes. And it allows you to take um, the normal amount of hay that they're supposed to get and just slow their consumption way down because they have to work to kind of pick the um, hay out of the smaller holes. Um, it's actually better for the horses to eat the hay that way because they're kind of designed to get small amounts over a long period of time and it mimics a little bit more grazing um, than just being able to um, eat flakes of hay. So that's good at keeping horses busy. Um, and I just had this little, um, if horses were given a choice, they'd graze 16 hours per day. 24. Yeah, 20, well, yeah, depending on the horse, yeah, sleep is not an option, nothing else happens. Um, and also just remember that ventilation is important. I know this time of year the tendency is to kind of close the barn up, shut the windows, lock them in tight, um, tuck everyone in, but the most important thing is actually ventilation. And so when you close the barn up, a lot of times you compromise that which you get buildup of ammonia and other pathogens like the dust and mold in the air um, from bedding and hay and it can cause more problems than having them be, you know, five, ten degrees warmer. Can it be like you shut it up at night and open, I mean, shut it at night and open it during the day or do you mean keep it open all? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to have it wide open all the time, but just a lot of times if you have the, like windows that um, you can keep cracked, things like that, I just wouldn't completely pack the barn up. Like I'd leave the windows partially open and like obviously you want to keep the elements out and you're not going to open the whole barn up. But um, if you can do little things in your barn, depending on how it's made to kind of improve ventilation, then it does help. So, yeah. Um, yeah if I have a horse that I prefer not to blanket at all. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on um, temperature and moisture. Does he get cold more at night, like when it's the temperatures, or when is he shivering? He doesn't have a good coat. Okay. Never, I've had him since he was seven months old. He just never grows a good, good okay. coat. Okay, okay. And um, it's mostly at night that he gets cold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I would, okay. then I would definitely start by blanketing him at night, if you can, just to help. Yeah. Does he have problems with weight loss at all during the winter, or does he...? Do okay. I usually feed them extra in the winter and keep them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If they're actively shivering and they're cold, then I'd definitely recommend um, blanketing him because it is expending a lot of body energy. And yeah. I think, you know, it's hard to know exactly what horses are feeling, but it can be a little uncomfortable, I know, when we're cold. So, um, you know, I think blanketing him at night is a good idea. And then possibly, and then going out during the day when it's warmer and you can be in the sun that's probably fine to have it off unless if you have like a really cold day, yeah. then maybe keep it on. Okay. Um, so 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. One degree, you know, and my horse is all alone now, and he's in a big shed, and it's kind of warped, so there might be a little space like that. Yeah. And I go in there, and it's five degrees, and he wears a blanket, but he's thirty-three years old, and it still bothers me nuts. Just the cold. Around. And my tendency is to want to go put up like plastic sheets over everything, and the doors and everything. But I guess, I mean, he's been okay so far, but. Seems really I know it does seem really cold and for them the difference is they're living outside so they're they're kind of acclimated to the temperature of course like five degrees is pretty extreme so like putting a blanket on that's great that's going to help them out a little bit because once we're getting really in those low temperatures they're having to work harder to keep themselves warm and especially with an older horse where they can fluctuate more in weight and you get concerned about that. Um, blanketing him is definitely a good idea. But if he seems, the, the big thing is looking at the horse. If he seems comfortable, he's not standing there shivering, um, then you know he's probably okay. And then you know giving him some extra hay can help too on those really cold days and give him some more calories um, to help with the, the metabolism, yeah. Up when you walk up. Yeah, yeah. It's just really scary to me. And you bag the back with big shavings, more shavings. Mm -hmm. Snuggle down. Yeah, and I stuff the cracks sometimes. Yeah. And then it's, um, but I, I want to do something like put like, plastic sheeting up, you know, for storm windows or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Is, it, is he in a um, three sided shed or a full? It's, it's a, a full one, but it's okay. pretty open enough. Okay. You know, okay. You could also it's double layer. Yeah. But when I go in there, he looks at me like, what's your problem? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the best, that's the best indicator, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it's hard for us because we are in houses that are, you know, 65 degrees, 70 degrees. And then yeah. you go out to five degrees, it's like a shock where they're, they're in it all the time. So even when the temperature changes, yeah. it doesn't happen in five minutes. It happens over a period of time. And so it gives them the ability to kind of acclimate to it. So... Yeah, I usually feel like just like their body too, like if they're in a blanket and you kind of slide your hand in along their chest and their shoulder, yeah. if they're nice and warm and they're not, you know, sweating, um, you know, and they're not shivering and they seem happy, they're, you know, eating, drinking, passing manure, all that, then they can, they can withstand a lot. Yeah. Is so. I've heard that too, like touch their ears. I don't know. Their ears are cold. I don't know if that's true. I think like, yeah, it's hard to, when it gets really cold, ears are, I feel like, going to get cold because they're like, you know, extremities, they don't have, you know, a lot of meat around them, if you will. So I feel like they're probably going to feel more cold to the touch, especially compared to the body of the horse. I don't know if like Helen or Derek, if you've ever heard that being, yeah. I, I, I also think you have to be very careful with older horses that have coats that are like unbelievably they don't get too hot with too much blanketing. Too. Yeah. You have to be, you have to really, because they don't, they don't regulate the body temperature very well. Right, right. And they tend to get hot. I mean, you have to be, I mean. You have to pay attention, yeah. You have to really pay attention to your individual horse. You can't just say, sometimes more is not better. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, I've got somewhere, though, Horses have the ability to, or just their their coats naturally are like insulated, and they can fluff them and kind of get air in between the layers, mm -hmm. so that acts as a, a natural insulation. And then if you blanket them, it, it kind of like lays it all down. Yeah, and someone just told me that at the barn tonight. And loses the inability to insulate itself. So how do you feel about that? I think to a certain degree, like that's a lot, a lot of the ways how they will thermoregulate thermo is like by piloerection when like, you know, the hair stands up and they get air in there. Um, but if you, the blanket is going to compress a little bit along the top line, but unless you have something that's like saran wrapping them in, it's not going to completely decrease that. Yeah. People say, yeah, like don't put a sheet on your horse, you'll crease them, the hair is going to be plastic. Yeah. And they won't be able to, I, like you said, kind of look at the horse and 
If yeah. I put him under my horse and he's got a sheet on, if it's like, you know, 40 degrees out, like I just put a medium blanket on him like today. Like yeah. Sheet on. And he's still, he's warm under there. It's blocking the wind, you know. They, I don't know if you ever heard of, they came up with these blankets that had, they were really funny. They were like, they had these like foam panels in them to lift, to hold the blanket off the horse. Hmm. So it's like a sheet. And then imagine like, these cores that run down the side. Interesting. The so what's the... And the claim was that you can leave this blanket on 24-7, you know, pretty much like fall through the winter, and the horse will, again, throw a regulate itself using that idea that the horse is, like, allowing air to be trapped between right. the, out of the blanket and the horse's body. Right. And I never saw it again after, like, tack of the day, so I think maybe yeah. it didn't do very well. Right. But because we do like to tend to want to snuggle them up in thick layers of blanket, right. I guess right. the whole, you know, whether it was a good idea or not, I don't know that it made it very well. Yeah, and I think it, it does. Like, it depends on the horse. I don't think you're, like, you're not going to, by taking a blanket and putting, on, putting it on them completely, decrease their inability to, to their ability to thermoregulate. Four years ago, you know, I had a horse in a, I had a, in kind of a hothouse blower situation, but then moved to a rougher situation. So I got him an Amigo um, waterproof sheet, mm -hmm. and that lays on him in such a way that it allows lots of air to be around it. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the only thing he wears year-round. He's got a pretty good coat, but it allows his coat to stay fluffy. Yeah, a lot of them are breathable. And from what I've read and my understanding of blanketing, the um, a lot of times they'll recommend if the horses are going out and it's cold and it's wet is to put even for horses with regular coats just to put waterproof blankets on them that are thin and breathable. Um, so it's been a great investment. It's like eighty dollars for Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The big thing. The big thing is keeping them dry because then that's really we know for sure that really decreases their inability to thermoregulate and they get cold. Um, Okay, so some factors to consider for shoeing. Um, does your horse wear shoes because of lameness or medical condition? Um, if that's the case, then not a good idea to just pull shoes off for the winter. Um, general quality of your horse's hooves and your vet slash farrier's um, opinion of their feet and how, what the best way to manage them are. So we need to keep in mind for um, shoeing, we need to shoe them for function in the winter weather, um, and most importantly, the footing. Um, mo as most of you know, um, boreums or boreum hybrid shoes are most commonly used, and some people use studs or chalks to help with grip. Um, snow pads can help prevent snow pack and help increase grip um, to, to decrease catastrophic injuries from slipping and falling. Um, another old little trick um, sometimes I feel like it works and sometimes I feel like it doesn't. Um, you guys may have a different experience, but spraying like the PAM, the non-stick on their feet, it's supposed to help um, with snowpack and make the snow easier to pick out of their feet. Um, and just keep in mind that the majority of um, snow-related injuries actually occur in small paddocks. A lot of people want to put horses in small paddocks so they don't go out in the big paddock and run around. Um, and that's just because the snow gets packed down and then it's more common for um, ice to form on that and for them for the footing to get slick. Um, exercise, um, still important to keep horses exercise during the winter, um, either controlled exercise or turnout. Um, we know that it's important for gastrointestinal motility um, and it helps prevent colic. So just always make sure that the footing is appropriate and then if you're trailing the roads are safe obviously. So tips to uh, winter riding. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that one's not. <laughs> um, just remember to adjust the workload. Um, riding in the snow is hard work. If you've ever had to, which I'm sure you all had, to muck through the snow to get out to your barns after we get one of our lovely storms and you're trucking through feet of snow, um, just make sure for the same thing you adjust time um, and speed in the saddle accordingly. Um, as we kind of touched upon, a wet horse can get cold, so allow for plenty of time um, to cool the horse out after you're riding. Um, and if the horse is sweating or does sweat when you ride him, apply a moisture wicking blanket. Um, be aware of the footing, snow, ice, mud, and even controlled arena footing. Um, just some common winter ailments that we see, and this is another important reason why 
Um, I talked about blanketing and blanketing properly because um, we can get some of these things with poor blanketing management. Um, so rain rot, it's caused by a bacterial infection um, and it affects moist areas of the skin. So um, bacteria and fungus love that warm, moist environment. Um, and you get it uh, in areas of coat drainage along the back and rump and lower limbs and sweat areas under the blanket. Um, big ways to prevent it, and it's much easier to prevent it than treat, especially in the winter. Um, to provide shelter from moisture, um, proper blanketing techniques, and proper um, cooling out ex after exercise, making sure the horse is nice and dry. It often appears as large crust-like scabs. Um, they can be about a quarter of an inch. You can get matted tufts of hair, and when then when you start picking them off, um, you can have um, pink skin underneath with pus, they're really gross. Um, treatment involves removing all the scabs, which is not fun. You get to clip all the hair, and then we're talking about doing um, shampooing with antimicrobial shampoo. So really not a fun thing to get in the middle of the winter. Um, this is, so recurrent airway obstruction, COPD or heaves are just a couple of names. Um, that we know for a lot of horses they get better in the winter some get worse kind of depends on if your horse um, It has more of a problem with like pollen type um, allergens or mold that they um, have in hay and so um, it's just basically an allergic response to different environmental allergens um, and that can include bacteria um, fungi, feed um, that you find in feed and grains, feces, dander, pollen. Um, and then four to six hours after exposure, the airways become inflamed um, and they narrow, become covered with mucus, obstructing normal airflow, and you see an increased effort um, in breathing. Um, one good way to prevent it, I was, I was talking about earlier, is good ventilation, especially if you know you have a horse um, with heaves, don't um, you know, t bundle them up, make sure they have plenty of ventilation. The more time they spend outside, the better. Um, and our treatment is usually housing changes where they're spending more time outside, um, bronchodilators and corticosteroids. Um, colic is a biggie, and impaction colic is the most common um, one that we see in the winter, and that's basically due to um, decreased water consumption. So remember all those good things about water consumption we talked about earlier. Um, another thing is um, that can lead is a risk factor is eating large amounts of poor quality hay and it leads to like a large amount of indigestible bulk which acts as um, kind of the how the impaction starts. So as we talked about earlier um, a thousand pound idle horse should consume a minimum of 10 to 12 gallons per water per day. And we talked about in the winter sometimes they can drink as much as 30 gallons of water a day. And this is interesting, an average adult will produce 10 gallons of saliva alone to soften and lubricate food. So if they drink a minimum of 10 gallons, that's, just go, that's straight to saliva alone. That doesn't include any of the rest of the places where they need water in their body for the day. Um, once again, we talked about exercise, which is essential and helps with normal intestinal function. Um, dental care, which we touched upon earlier, um, allowing teeth to grind food properly. Um, when a horse's teeth aren't working effectively, then you're getting larger particles of hay, which can kind of um, start acting as, um, you know, a way to start blocking the intestines. Um, also deworming, which we touched upon earlier too. Um, internal parasites can irritate the intestinal tract, cause intestinal blockage, um, and compromise blood supply of the intestine. So everything's starting to come together here when we're talking about colic. So clinical signs, as you all know, you're good horse people and are here. Um, not eating, lethargy, pawing, looking at the flank, laying down, rolling, thrashing, depends on um, the pain level. So treatment for impaction colic, um, we always start medically and that's um, by using a NG tube and giving them laxatives. Um, sometimes um, it gets to the point where oral fluids and laxatives aren't enough and they have to be um, on IV fluids, which once again this time of year starts to get tricky because things are freezing. So you're starting to kind of look at a possible trip to the hospital um, when that happens. Um, 
obviously pain management and um, in really bad cases sometimes surgical intervention if you can't get things under control medically. Um, if you suspect your horse is caulking, obviously um, calling the office sooner than later. The sooner they're treated gives them a better chance for a good outcome. <coughs>